All right. Uh, just want to welcome everyone back to episode three here. Uh, tonight, we're really fortunate to have two guys with us today, Barry Butt uh, and Ryan Nelly out of Premier Strength. So I'll just let them give a quick intro of themselves to you guys, and then we'll kind of get started. All right. I guess I'll go first. I'm the old guy. So um, Barry Butt, um, basically trained hockey players for about 20 years now. Uh, own a company called Premier Strength. Um, it, you know, basically our focus is on 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 off ice training, strength and conditioning, speed development for hockey players, and hopefully trying to get that transition from you know giving them that that athletic ability and taking it back on the ice and transferring it into their game. Ryan, go ahead. Sure, um, Ryan Nellis. Well, it gets called Nelly sometimes. <laughs> uh, and I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I work with Barry, basically. I own my own company called Net Sports Performance as well. But, yeah, primarily, primarily working with Barry with the hockey players in our off-ice training. That's pretty much Perfect. It. Um, so the first uh, kind of thing I want to talk about a little bit with you guys is uh, the one thing that keeps coming up everywhere I talk to you, all the players, all the coaches, is the word fast. Everyone wants to be fast. Um, so my first question for you guys is how does what you do off ice in terms of trying to create speed, all that work, how does that translate into on ice? But what's, what's your take on that? Well, I think sprint speed has a, almost a hundred percent correlation to skating speed. You it's, it's technically different. There's no question about it, but you rarely see a guy who can run fast skate slow. Rarely. Never. Never, actually. <laughs> yes, never. And you see guys who can't run, who can't generate force and can't put force into the ground to get down the track. They can't skate either. They're not fast on the ice, no matter how technically good they might be at skating. And I actually even think that if they don't have the, the power to sprint, they're probably not even technically going to be able to skate very well. That's, you know, I've seen it forever. Forever and ever, every time we get a fast skater, he's fast off the ice as well. Yeah, hundred percent agree. I mean, I think benefits of doing speed work and sprinting are massive. I think you actually almost as an overload of what you're doing when you're skating. I think your your peak forces you're hitting when you're sprinting versus skating are higher. Way higher. So it's almost a way to train skating without training it, and you're actually and it's gonna. Just transfer more. I think you can actually raise your peak speed on the ice better with skating at a certain, or with sprinting, sorry, at a certain point. Once you're advanced enough with your uh, technical ability skating, uh, sprinting is going to push your ceiling higher than uh, just sprinting as, skating as fast as you can. Will. Do you think that comes back down to like a muscle fiber composition or pure strength, explosiveness? What do you think the, the key is on that? Combination for sure. I mean, you know, anybody who's, who's got a good muscle fiber composition leaning towards fast, which is going to be able to generate more, more power is going to be able to put more force into the ground. They're going to be faster. They're going to be able to skate faster. They're going to be able to run faster, but you can't, I mean, you can train that a little bit, but you can't control someone's genetics. There's no question. Genetics are a factor there and their and their you know, their fiber type for sure. But strength is a factor um your ability to to generate power meaning speed being able to move a load fast is is a factor for sure we see we'll see it too with guys that their their speed doesn't come until they gain strength so they might they might run okay they might they might look okay um skating or or running but they're weak they're not strong enough so when they when they hit the ground they lose, they lose control. They, they don't, they don't generate or they don't transfer force properly because they don't have the strength to do it. Might be a leak somewhere in the, in, at the hips, at the trunk, whatever it might be. So they can't generate that force from the ground, transfer it through to movement. So it, there's a lot of factors there for sure. But I mean, both of those are hugely important. I think the big thing too, from like, just from the on ice standpoint that I see is, you always see those players that are technically very sound at a young age, but they're not fast. So it's kind of like, how do you convince them to keep maintaining that technical focus and then tell them, yeah, that, that speed will come if it comes when the strength gets there. You 100%. can't have one without the other, right? No. Just to kind of follow up. Sorry, Nelly, go ahead. No, I was just going to say like, 100% agree. Like, 
sometimes even technique will be limited by strength if you're not strong enough to hold certain positions your technique will never really fall into place and so they fall they fall together almost all the time i think one thing that i actually kind of really like to look closely at and this kind of brings me to my second question is just the technical aspect of uh, the first kind of three steps, because again, that's like those catch words we hear in, in hockey all the time, right? Like first step quickness, first three steps over and over and over. That's all anyone wants to get better at. Like, how do you think that on ice, the technical aspect of it? I know you mentioned earlier, the actual technical piece of sprinting is a lot different. But do you think there's a correlation between the on ice start technique and the track start technique? Yes, I I, th I actually think in sprinting with a hockey player, especially, I think their start is the only thing we can actually technically change and train. Once they get up and running, ugh, you're not fixing that mechanics with those guys. They're just too they're too ingrained in their skating stride. So I think it's a. I mean, we try to work on technique sprinting, talking sprinting now. Mm -hmm. We try to work on their technique sprinting when they get up to speed. But they they just they want to go so fast that they always revert back to their old habits. And I think it's a I think it's a as a in training hockey players, I think it's a it's it's a real waste, not a waste of time, but it really takes a lot of time to correct their sprint technique that you're just you don't have time to do that. You're never gonna do it. I mean, there's some real prime examples out there. I had one athlete ask me today, so what what should I do better? Well, he's already fast. His times, we're running 20s and his times are fast. He can move. So I even said to him, my comment to him was if I try to check, correct your sprint and your your sprinting looks terrible, it does not look like a sprinter should look, but somehow you're able to put force into the ground in the right direction and get down the track. And it works for you. So if I sit there and I try and technically change your sprinting, I'm probably going to make you slower and it might not transfer to the ice very well because this, it's not the exact same top end speed mechanics, but those first three strides, I think we can do a lot with our, with our athletes. And that's what we focus on. We focus on those first three strides off the start line, putting force in the right direction, getting them leaning forward. Same thing you would do on the ice. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a big trans a transfer there and a big correlation. Definitely. Like when you get talk about transfer, like it's always going to be about what are the forces at what joint angles, essentially mm -hmm. that's the most specific you're really going to get. And you look at the first three steps in sprinting and the angles are almost exactly the same. You're projecting at the 45, your ankles at the same angle. You want that stiff contact through the ball of the foot without the heel drop that we talked about. We talk about skating all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the top end speed isn't the same. No, like, the top end isn't the same. But those three steps, absolutely. Low leg recovery, we always talk about that. Developing your rhythm and your rise as you come out of the out of the start will transfer over as well. And then, yeah, when you get to the top, top speed, it is different because you are going to sit in a more squatted position in the skate. And you're not opening up and getting into a more extended leg position. But those first three, it's nearly identical in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think the big, like the the simple way to look at it too is those first three steps in skating, there's very little glide, right? As soon as glide comes into play, it's completely a write-off. Mm -hmm. right? And that's where you can get that direct correlation between the two is when the glide's not a factor in there. Yeah, absolutely. No question. And that's, and, and you know, we, when we're sprinting, I, I rarely try to correct a guy's mechanics after those first three strides. But those first three strides weaken, and it's, and it's not even necessarily making their mechanics exactly like a sprinter. I mean, I'm not a sprint coach. I was fortunate to be around a really great sprint coach for a long, long time. So I learned a lot from him. But that's all he would ever focus on too, was let's get those first three strides really good with these guys. The rest of it will take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of guys that, that can run 20 meters really, really fast and they don't look good at all. You bring a sprint coach in and they're going to look at them and they're going to try and correct that. After 20 meters, I don't care anymore with a hockey player. Like I really don't. Like I don't care if you can run a 40. I mean, we run 30 sometimes, but that's more to just to get a little endurance, a little speed endurance in them more than anything. We don't, uh, you know, we don't really look at the technique at that point, but it is, it goes back to, it's always that acceleration, those first three strides. I know we talked to you, like just with the on ice component, the idea of like constant force production into the ice mm -hmm. in theory, that's all the sprinters trying to do, right? Constantly trying to provide acceleration forces, trying to constantly build. Yeah. And if you do that on ice, essentially you're going to be fast. 
right? Mm -hmm. You can't be long and slow. You got to be long and fast and long. Yeah. And so, and I think, I guess going to that too, like, I think one of the other ways sprinting transfers so well in the first three strides is the ground contact times at the acceleration in a sprint are a lot closer to what they are in skating than they are later. Like when you get to top speed running, your ground contacts are so quick that they're, they become very different than hockey where you have a much longer ground contact. Yeah, contact it gets it. Yeah, it gets longer, right? In hockey, the ground contact gets longer as you get up to speed, whereas in sprinting, it gets shorter. So that the that the start is the only time that it's even close to the same. I do think there's some benefit to top end sprinting as well, though, like just in terms of nervous system mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But uh, in direct transfer to the skating, it's yeah, not not super strong yet. No, it's it's absolutely important from a from a training standpoint, but not from a transfer to skating for sure. No question about it. I mean, the other thing too, that we never talk about, or that, that a lot of times we don't like, I get that question that you get Brian all the time too, is how do I get faster? How do I get faster? I know my coach says I need to be faster. This scout says I need to be faster. All these guys say I need to be faster, but we take these kids and we put them on a track and we have them run. I'm like, you're fast. Mm -hmm. So now what's the problem? Is it technical skating? Is it, decision making what's what's the issue now right like if it's you tell me a kid's slow and i bring him out and i put him on the track and i put him on the lights and i say run 20 and he's he's lightning what what do i do then like i'm like well you're fast you know we can make you faster maybe but you're already fast now how do we get that to correlate on the ice some guys it's they just don't make the decision to go yeah, on the ice, right? Yeah, that's a hundred percent. I know we've, I've had some guys do the same thing. It's like, when we do our testing, you're fast. Your coach tells you not. So clearly you're not anticipating or reacting or getting yeah. in a position to jump into space. Mm -hmm. So that's more of a decision-making or reaction piece than an actual technical skating piece or like yeah. you said, a, a sprinting piece. Uh, the next, the next question, I'm actually really interested in what you guys have to say about this. So, um, the one thing that I'm kind of noticed too, and maybe you guys have noticed a little bit is a lot of the new kind of wave NHL players we're seeing now are a lot smaller. They're a little bit lighter. They're not carrying as much mass when they play. Um, so my thought for you guys, are you guys hearing maybe players are coming, you know, heading into camp. We want to have lean out and want to lighten them up or what, what do you guys think the correlation between kind of weight and type of player that's happening in today's game? I think it's very individual. I I think it's always been very individual and, and I, I still think it is. I think it's, it's, you know, what, what kind of mass is that person capable of carrying comfortable carrying? I, 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 I think body weight is something that in a hockey player, it's, you, you don't fight with it and say, okay, you know, let's work hard to try and get you 10 pounds heavier, 10 pounds lighter. I think you train properly, you eat healthy, your weight is what it is that's i firmly believe that the guys gravitate to once they're adults now when they're 15 16 17 that's different but once they're once they're adults once they're in their 20s i think they gravitate to a certain weight i think it's um i think it's wrong to say oh get five pounds lighter you're gonna get faster it's it's wrong is that right for some guys 100 percent, it's right for some guys if they're carrying too much body fat or or, or whatever it might be or the style of player you know, you mentioned um, in a text, guys like McDavid Barzell, they don't make, they don't have contact with anybody ever. They're fast, they're dynamic, they're, that's their game. To think that, okay, McDavid's whatever McDavid weighs, I don't know what he weighs, but to think that he's, he's this weight and somebody else to say, oh, if I drop 15 pounds, I'm going to be able to be like McDavid is, is ridiculous to think that. Yeah. So I think it's very dependent on the individual, what, where you play, what position you play. Um, I mean, I got an NHL D man right now who's 200 pounds. He needs to be heavier, right? He's got to get in front of the net, push, push big forwards around, get in the corners, win battles. It's going to be hard to do that at 200 pounds. Are you going to be a little quicker, a little more agile at 200 than you are at 210? Maybe, yeah. but, it, but the trade-off might not be enough for how for the lack of strength or the lack of mass mass moves mass i mean it's it's that simple right there's yeah. a reason johnny boychuk is very successful in the nhl because he's a big man who can move mass he can push guys around and get guys out of the front of that win battles in the corner because of his size if he was 210 pounds he wouldn't be nearly as effective as he is at 220 225 
right? So for yeah. some guys, yeah, they need to be a little bit lighter and it will make them more agile and they need that. But it, I think it really depends on body type, who you are, position you play. I don't think you can paint everybody with the same brush. I think position makes a huge factor for sure. Uh, Ryan? Well, I think there's a lot of factors into it. Again, I agree with Barry, totally individual. And it is kind of coming down to, do they need to add weight? Do they need to lose weight? It can really be a question of what are their weaknesses? What are their strengths? Does it fit their style of play? If they're weak and they like to play aggressive, well, you know, they probably need to be a little bigger. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I mean, assuming that your body composition is good, which I think we're kind of assuming in this discussion already, that they're already pretty lean and they're going to be lean at heavier weight as well. Yeah. I think everyone kind of hits a good relative strength at a different weight. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what you're going for when you're talking about speed, especially you want to have a really high strength relative to your body weight. So yeah, some people have a hard time gaining strength without putting a little bit of mass on, or they need to add that little bit of mass to gain that extra little touch of strength. And some, it doesn't matter as much, but it, so you got to, you kind of kind of play with how they feel. I mean, as you gain weight, your conditioning can be affected if it's enough, yeah. but you can also condition to, to your new weight. And I'm, I think that's just a slow process. I look at some of those young guys like you had mentioned, and I think one of the functions of these guys coming in a little lighter too, is that they're entering the league pretty young. Yeah. And I look at a guy like uh, David Pasternak. He, I think he was 165 pounds in his first year in the league and now he's 195 and he's still getting better. So is his weight going up, making him slower or worse? No. Is it yeah. helping him? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe he's just getting more experienced. I think McDavid, same thing. I think he's up probably 10, 15 pounds from when he first came to the league. McKinnon, all these young guys with skills. So I think that's part of it. I think kids are a lot more active, or not active, but they're tra training a lot more before coming in at young ages, like our 16, 17-year-olds. They're on the ice sometimes three hours a day, mm -hmm. plus two hours in the gym, and you're adding up. It's just tough to eat enough calories, so they're yeah. just having a hard time putting that well, weight on. It is. That's the big thing with the young kids. They don't eat enough. Yeah. Like the 16, 17-year-olds, they don't eat enough. And everybody correlates food with weight gain or weight loss. <laughs> they don't correlate it with performance, right? So it's like, well, if I eat more, I'm going to gain weight. Well, no, you're just going to perform better because you're putting more fuel in your body. You might not gain a pound but uh, you'll perform better. And that's the big challenge we have with a lot of the young guys. But then, you know, you, you look at other guys. I mean, you look at a guy like Ovechkin, pretty successful career, pretty explosive, pretty dynamic. He's 230 pounds or 225 or whatever. He's a big, big, big man. And yeah. you're right. Yeah, like you're a dry, not gonna cell, tell. dry cells, body dry. type quite large, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And those guys get around the ice pretty good. So I think I mean, there's, you know, we've seen that. I mean, you look at a guy, even like a guy like Dustin Bufflin, He's a monster. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever never accused him of being slow for how big he is. Yeah. Right? He's a, he's a big guy and he scares people out there because it's a big body moving fast. So it's, you know, it, again, it's, it's very individual. It's just an interesting, think, interesting topic. <laughs> I do is. think that there's a, a longevity component to size and strength. More strength, <laughs> I guess strength, I think, is extremely important and size can help with that. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of the beating you're taking on the body. But you look at the guys with the most games played in the NHL history. They're big men. Big men. All of, almost all of them. Like yep. very few small guys made it past 1,500 games. You look at the longest playing guys in the league right now. Marlowe, Thornton, mm -hmm. Omi, Spiro Vetchkin's up there. That's a stall. They're all heavy. They're all big. Yep. I mean, there's some smaller guys that have done it. But I think they're more of the exception than the rule. Yeah. And it's not to say that you have to be the biggest guy in the league, but. Even, even small guys have played lots of games, like, you know, your Martin St. Louis, I think the way Crosby's headed right now, like, they're all, they're all pretty thick and heavy. And there, yeah. there's definitely a protective effect of that strength on the joints, just the damage that they are taking in the game. So there's that kind of armor building, we would call it, I guess. Yeah. To, uh, I guess it depends on whether play. it's preseason, regular season, or postseason hockey, because those are all three very different types of hockey that you're playing, too. Yep. Yep. True. Yep. Well, and, and you, you could time. argue that they're, they're at their physical worst when they get to the postseason. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest like they, you know they get beat up through the season they're not training as much they're losing weight most guys are probably lighter in the in the in the postseason than they are in the early in the season right so yeah. they're sleeping poorly and cortisol's yeah. high all the time and all sorts of bad stuff going on in the season so. for sure the last thing i just want to get you guys to maybe quickly touch base on i know you probably get this too but i've i've been getting lots of emails the last few weeks about things that players can do to work on quickness or quick feet 
um, you know, maybe if there's some simple ideas out there that players can use that might help them. Sprint. <laughs> I think we already talked about three it. Steps, right? right? Like mark out 10 meters and sprint 10 meters and then, you know, lengthen that out to 20 meters and sprint 20 meters, but work on that acceleration, work on that first three steps. Three things that we do is we work on linear speed and focus on acceleration, focus on starts. We work on agility where it's a, a, a set pattern, like a pro agility, people know it as five, 10, five, three cones and just change in directions. But you know the pattern, you know where you're supposed to go, you know where the cones are. And then the last thing we do is we do some cognitive agility where we set out patterns and we'll use tennis balls where they have to go and move different tennis balls to different colors of cones and things like that, where they have to, they have to make a decision and think. And we just change those patterns up all the time. So that comes back to the hopefully trying to get some of that decision-making transfer of speed. And we time, we time a lot of these things. Like we'll set the timing lights or we'll hand time. And just to see how, uh, how different guys are from linear speed to agility to having to make a decision and be agile. Yeah. So those are, those are three things that we do there. Perfect. Uh, Ryan, anything you want to add? I'm just kind of going back to that too. Like you want to start from different positions as well. I think mm -hmm. that's got a lot of benefit coming out of awkward positions, starting sideways, starting from a push up per se, all sorts of different ones, even coming out of a, maybe a slight jogging or a sideways jog and then changing directions into a full sprint. I think that's a lot of how you're, you're never really starting from a standstill in hockey either. So, I mean, there's lots of different ways you can do it out of different motions to get to kind of learn how to get your acceleration quick to get your feet back under you quickly I think that's a big part of what's called quick feet so and then just putting that force on the ground what sometimes people can consider fast feet is just that high turnover which high turnover is kind of a result of uh partially can be like the strength of like your hip flexors pulling you forward and stuff like that but also just a rebound effect of the ground reaction force you're putting in and how fast that will kick it forward again I think players do have to understand, I mean, just because your feet move quick doesn't mean you're covering any distance, nope. too, which is a whole other topic that we don't have time to get into. But right, yeah. that idea of, of being quick is great, but you still got to cover ice, you still got to cover the track, you still got to cover something. It's the idea of putting yourself in that position to continually provide force into the ground. At the end well, of the I'll, I'll tell you one thing that, that I think when people think of quick feet off the ice, the first thing they go to is a ladder, agility ladder. It, it's it's not going to help you. It's, it's not, it's, it's going to teach you some coordination and it's going to teach you to pick your feet up and put them down quickly, but it's not good. You're not putting any force into the ground. You're not covering a distance. You're, you're within a small space of like within your arms with how often are you doing that? So it might help you with that, that getting your feet set and ready to move, but it doesn't really help your speed. It doesn't help your acceleration, but again, it might help coordination a little bit. Um, I think you're better off doing something where you're moving over you know 10 15 meters kind of thing where you have to move over a bigger distance stop and change directions and be quick in those settings than you are using a agility ladder if i if we ever use the agility ladder we just put it into warm-ups perfect i would say jumps as well i guess is another one i guess we talk about uh, those starts and just the ankle stiffness you need on that start then you can get that with a lot of jumps and there's lots of different types of jumps you can do mm -hmm. uh, with younger guys obviously but uh like just bouncing around is good. Skipping ropes is a good way to start with lots of those guys if they're just at home. You just like little, just any kind of bouncing, moving your feet in different directions, different kinds of jumps. And then thinking can you go for bigger jumps too, jumps for height, jumps for distance. Like we love skips for height, skips for yeah. distance. Just teaching the foot to move at different angles, letting it roll through. That stuff really does translate pretty well over time. So it just develops that ankle stiffness you need. All right, perfect. Thanks for hopping on, guys. Uh, hopefully uh, we get back training and getting back on the ice skating soon in my my world but hopefully we're not stuck inside too much longer no hopefully yep. not thanks a lot Brian thanks, thanks guys Brian.